Okay, bagels in LA versus bagels in New York. Fucking trash out here, dude. It's so bad. It is the worst like thing. I found one place. It's in uh, the Grand Central Market over here. Yeah, and Where it's called Wexler is? Bagel, uh, Wexler Deli, and like literally they have like the perfect like New York bagel yeah. with like, whipped cream cheese and like the whole thing. Yeah, but dude, I can't tell you how. I live it, my well my place in LA. There's a oh, yeah, there's a place you. called East Coast Bagels. And it's the wackest shit. Yeah, ever. dude. Like, there's a like a place like Garden State Bagels in my house or something like that, and like it's it's just like they put like cornmeal on the bagel, mm-hmm. and like I'm like, come on. I hear guys. it's the uh, tap water. Yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah. it's the same thing. Like, I moved to San Diego in high school, and we used to go to this pizza spot, and the dude would import water from New York. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty crazy. Uh, let's see. So this will be completely edited. So feel free to speak freely, and you could and make notes of what you got. <laughs> yeah, and like afterwards we could just I, be like, I can, I can be a fucking real open book. Yeah. Do it, man. Yeah, cool. That's what this is about. Fuck it. Um, all good, all good. That's all right. <laughs> you want, you, do you have headphones? Uh, no, I was trying to make sure my computer was on silent. Uh, okay. Cool. Silent, so when I press the button, <laughs> I turn that on. All good, all, all good. good. All good. So basically, when I moved out here, uh, I basically moved out here with a bunch of debt. Uh-huh. Uh, ended up in the studio with this guy, and, uh, you know, we ended up, one night he called me up, and he's like, I want to make a fuck you, you fucking fuck shirt. Uh-huh. And... Literally, we came to the office, we sat down, started making it, and then, like, it just spurred into this whole thing. That's, like, why when I say, like, me choosing Chinatown Market as a name, it was, like, Alex and I just sitting there and just literally being, like, oh, Chinatown Market, perfect. Yeah. Like, bootleg, all, and it just, like, didn't even think about it. Right. And I think I Googled, like, Canal Street Market, and I saw the thing was already there, so I was, like, oh, Chinatown Market, cool. Oh. Yeah. So, wow, Canal Street Market was already there back then? I think, like, the domain was owned, and, oh, like, okay, I was okay. looking for something that I could just go and buy all the... I wonder if you would have gotten the racial flack from Canal Street Market. I wonder, you know? Because, I mean, it's like, yeah. I'm not saying Chinatown, but it is yeah, in Chinatown. It, it's like, like, it doesn't... I'm Chinese, and it doesn't bother me at all. And so it's like... I didn't even think race when I saw it, and I knew a white person did it, but, like, I'm just trying to see, like, what if you named it, like, Mott Street Market? Would people be like... Yeah. I don't understand what's my bothering thing was, them. I was going to literally I think it's just, just the word China is yeah. bothering them, but yeah. you're not referencing exactly. And I'm being very <laughs> conscious of that. But at the end of the day, it just is what it is. And like sometimes I'm, I joke around. I'm like, "What should I just call it? Jew Market? You can get mad at me now." Like you know, right. like I don't know. Like <laughs> what do you call it? I'll call it whatever. Like, I just want to make clothes. Like that's really what this is. It's like not about the brand or the yeah, name. Or it's about just graphic yeah. T-shirts. Like that's all it is. Right. It's so funny. From Hype Beast Radio, I'm Jeff Staple, and this is the Business of Hype a show about creative entrepreneurs, brand builders, innovators, and the realities behind the dreams they've built. All right, so for those who don't know, let's begin with, uh, with an intro of who you are and what you do. My name is uh, Mike Sherman, based in Los Angeles, California, 27, and I am a designer and entrepreneur. What's 27? Oh, you're 27 I'm years 27 old. I'm 27 years old. Oh, you're so young. Yeah. <laughs> young gunner. <laughs> All right. I'm glad you still call me young because I feel like as I'm getting close to 30, I'm like, damn, I'm no longer like the baby. Like when I dropped out of college and I'm like 19 and doing all this stuff, I'm like, fuck, man, it's been eight years. I'm like, shit. Well, when I decided to like bring you on for the show, it felt a little bit like a grasshopper moment from how I met you, you know, totally. back in the day to like now you've built this thing that is um, at the very least like pressworthy and interesting as a almost like an experiment to me that's how i see it you know it's like a it's like a statement and experiment on what's going on in fashion and street culture and collaboration and even multi-billion dollar corporation branding you know yeah so it's kind of like all of that making a statement at once so i thought let's bring you on and see what you have to say about this you're, yeah, you're a man of mystery i like talking about these things so all right so let's go back first to to give a little brief um history lesson uh when did you get your start into into sort of like creative making you know clothes just dabbling in stuff so i started off in like high school i basically moved from new york to california i had no friends uh i had a mac computer i just got like an emac and i just downloaded like a trial of adobe illustrator i had some printer paper that i could use with an iron and i just started making t-shirts i uh i think my first clothing brand name was like newcastle clothing it was like all based off of like this beer, you know, I mean, yeah, not, not, but beer. not actually based off the beer. I didn't even realize I was there. So like <laughs> I, Newcastle was where I grew up in outside of New York. It was like a, the county of where I was at. Mm-hmm. And I just thought it was a good name. And then realized later, you know, at age like 16, beer exists and, uh, you know, not a good name. But 
just started off like printing t-shirts in my house. And then eventually I took the bar mitzvah money I had in my bank account, which was like, you know, four or $5,000 that was all gifted. And I went and bought t-shirts. So, so you're like 16 or something. I was uh, 15 years old and like a uh, freshman in high school. Uh-huh. And my parents had both worked in the garment industry, but it was not something that I cared about as a kid. My mm-hmm. dad worked in sales for girls denim and my mom was a, you know, designer for women's wear as well as kids wear. Okay. So um, what were you into in terms of brands back then? You know, it's funny, like when I first moved to California, I was still this young suburban kid. I had moved to California. All of a sudden I saw surfing, I saw Quicksilver, I saw Billabong, I saw Ruka, I saw Mm -hmm. all these brands, even like Crew and, you know, all these other brands. I was like, oh my God, skateboard culture, surf culture, this is so crazy. I grew up in like suburban New York where it was like Abercrombie and Fitch, North Face, like Fleece and, you know, like... Timberland. Yeah, and like you had the the full curved brim hats and like Uh the whole look, like that was a thing. Yeah. And like athletic shoes. And I think like moved to California, all of a sudden it's like Vans and Chucks and like Mm -hmm. this whole other style that had never existed to me. So that opened my eyes to something totally new. I quickly adapted. I became this chameleon. I started wearing like Ruka, all those other brands. Mm -hmm. and, And then it was... It wasn't until this store called Univ opened in San Diego when I was a freshman in high school Mm -hmm. that uh, it opened my eyes. I basically walked into that store the first day uh, and they had BBC, they had ice cream, they had this brand called Salvador, which is still around, but, you know, Uh isn't in the same category as it was. Um, You know, they were selling uh, cut or it was um, Omar's old brand, Um, uh, copy or like copy copy and paste or like... Or R and D, yeah, R and D, uh, rip off and duplicate. Yeah, uh, rip off and duplicate. They had yeah. that. They had like you know gourmet when it first mm-hmm. came out. Like I had those blue like Jordan Elevens that were redone and like, yeah. dude, it's just like it, it blew my mind. Uh-huh. Like it was something that I was like, this translates to me. It has a little bit of that classic New York style, but then is tied in with that whole like you know California thing that's happening with graphics yeah. and like the fun vibe. And right. being in San Diego, it's like a place where there's literally no style. So mm-hmm. it's like you know it's just like Florida where it's just all mesh shorts, flip flops, and that whole thing. But this was that one place where I could go find all these things. Mm-hmm. And, and then that opened me up into the store called Five and a Dime. And then it opened me up into this whole other world. I was interning for a store called The Physics in San Marcos, which was literally like a small streetwear store. They sold only and a few others. And yeah, that kind of uh, got my foot in the door. I would go to events with these guys. Like they would sponsor like a dance battle and like other things. And I would just be there. If I mm-hmm. could design something, if I could pack orders, if I could, whatever it was, I was just going to do it. What do you think made you so enamored with this culture? I would... Because uh, you sound like, when you describe it, you almost sound like a drug addict being exposed to like meth for the first time. You know what's <laughs> funny is that my parents always said to me that I had a pretty addictive personality. Mm-hmm. Um, my dad is an alcoholic, uh, you know, sober for 15 years now, but um, it's always been said that I have this like weird addictive personality where when I was a kid, my parents said, you can't have... Uh, what is it, Krispy Kreme. I would get on my bike, I would take my change, I would bike to the supermarket, I would get the Krispy Kremes, come home, and put them in my room. Mm-hmm. And Stash them. Like just- my mom found it and she started to sit me down and be like, you have an addictive personality. Like, they, like you're they just, knew Krispy Kreme was they too knew. dangerous. At the time, I'm like, you're crazy. But like, it's, it's a reality. So right. like, luckily for me, I've been able to hone those things into, into like focused kind of things. But I guess for me, it was like, I loved creating, I loved art, mm-hmm. but I wasn't like the best illustrator. I wasn't the best like painter. I wasn't the best of any of those things. I didn't see that I could become that. So I looked at it as like, cool, I can make these items which people can have forever and they can experience it, wear it, share it. Mm-hmm. It was like, this is amazing. And I think I just like made my first t-shirt and when I like, I caused this huge ruckus at my high school and it kind of opened up the floodgates. What was that shirt? So I had taken a picture of a kid in my class and he basically had like his finger over his nose. It made it look like his face was on a scanner. I photoshopped out his hand. So it literally just looks like a smashed face. And I did like some weird cutout filter on Photoshop, which I thought was cool at the time. Uh, made his teeth gold, printed it on a shirt, mm-hmm. made 36 shirts, showed up to school, ended up selling them out. The kid didn't get a shirt, but I had <laughs> him sign a document releasing the photo to me. Okay. And so... This caused a fight with the kid and another person who got the shirt on campus. Like a physical getting, fight. A physical fight over the shirts. I get called into the principal's <laughs> office and my parents get a call like, we're going to suspend your son for selling and distributing on campus. So like a drug charge, but for selling t-shirts on campus. Mm-hmm. So at the time it was like, oh shit, like I'm about to get in trouble. But like this, at the same time, I'm like realizing like I just made a fucking impact off of 
you know, just making a t-shirt. Clothing. Yeah. And it was like, wow, this is cool. Like you I, even did your due diligence and had him sign a document. Yeah. Like, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what I was thinking, but yeah, I just thought it was like the right thing to do. I would love and to see that released. God, it was like literally like, like a two sentence with like a signature. Cool with this? Yeah. I mean, I, it's like the, the high school <laughs> agreement, but yeah, man. And so like that all kind of sparked this like whole ruckus. And then I got kind of dubbed Mikey Merchandise in my school. So that was like my nickname. I was like, in the yeah. yearbook as Mikey Merchandise, I would sell t-shirts out of the awesome. back of my car. Uh-huh. And junior year of high school, I was playing, you know, I was playing high school basketball. I thought I'd go to college and maybe play in like a D2 school or D3 probably because I was not that good. Yeah. And uh, shit, man, I, I, uh, I broke my hand and started smoking weed and started making t-shirts seriously, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. like it, And not to say that like the smoking weed and all this other shit, but it, it kind of like me losing the sports side of my life, it, it right. took that that kind of addiction that we just talked about and applied it to something else yeah. where I love basketball. That was my shit. Like mm-hmm. I'm born and raised in that shit, but like the reality is I should have accepted that I can't dunk it. I'm not going <laughs> to, you know, it's just not going to happen. Right. So that kind of led into everything else. So okay. kind of like allowed me to realize like this could be what you do. An early valuable lesson that can be learned from Mikey merchandise. A lot of people I meet are down the hustle. They're down to work the long hours and they're down to commit but they just don't know what to commit to. They haven't found their passion yet. But in spite of that, every single person I've ever met has one thing in common. There is something that they love to do. They might not make a living from that, but there is something they love so much they can't stop doing it. And in most cases, their job has nothing to do with that activity. But Mike realized at an early age what his passion was. And since then, he's been figuring out just what to do with that one thing. It's the first major step to success. Even if you're dead broke and making a ton of mistakes. Why? Because you're doing the thing you love to do. You're already ahead of 95% of the population. And if you really love it, who cares how long it takes? You're having fun. Making money from it? That's just a technicality. That is, you know, the thing that gets you excited. I'm like, right. this is a whole new revolution. I'm going to make shirts for this, but whatever. And yeah. like, I just got into it, you right. know, and yeah, it just kind of like led into me interning at Univ and kind of getting fully into the game. I met the guys at Alpha Numeric, mm-hmm. met Aliasha, Mirko, all these other people. And all these people just influenced me in little pockets of ways, whether it was like, I forget the designer at Alpha Numeric. Uh, he's a pretty well known, you probably know him. Uh, but I remember like a long time ago him saying, like, I hate brands that misspell their names. And, uh, mm-hmm. and that will always stick with me. Mm-hmm. And then like, I taped a box really shitty and Mirko was like, what the fuck are you doing? And that will forever stay with me. My interns or my employees will never tape a shitty box, mm-hmm. you know? And if you can't tape a box, get the fuck out of here. Yeah. You know? So I'm a, I'm a box taping Nazi. Also. It's, it's the little <laughs> things. Cause I remember I took two boxes. I tried to take a skateboard and cover both ends and then tape the middle. Uh-huh. And then we were sending it to like Sweden. And like, he looked at me and was like, what the fuck do you think you're doing? <laughs> So, you know, it's, uh, it's all those little experiences, I think, yeah. that have built me to where I am today and being able to, like, understand that hard work. Because, I mean, as we all know, I mean, I get DMs every day mm-hmm. being like, I want a job. Send me a free T-shirt. I want to promote your shit. I want to be this. And it's like, what? <laughs> yeah. Because even, I mean, and we'll talk about it in a little bit, but, like, when we had our conversation, like, it took me a year or two to fully grasp what that did for me at the time. Mm-hmm. And I've talked about it with many people about like our conversation and how it influenced everything that I am today. It's like I could be working for you or I could be working with you. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. because of what happened, I'm able to work with you, not under you. Yeah. And to me, it was one of the best gifts I had in an interview because you could have very well just given me a job and let me find my way up the, the ladder mm-hmm. and, you know, work my way up in the staple. But you kind of challenged me, yeah. you know, and that And by the way, there's nothing wrong with working for staple. <laughs> no, and 100 percent, totally. Yeah. But I would never have been able to have this conversation eye to eye to say, Jeff, let's work together, right, because right. it would always be the employee employer type of situation. Obviously, yeah. you know, one day I could work out of that and become the eye to eye, but it takes that much longer mm-hmm. to do it. Yeah, it was a different path. For and sure. side note, no kids, you can't just cheat everything and, and have it happen. Like <laughs> you got to go through the shit. <laughs> so how do you end up in New York? So I uh, was in high school in San Diego, and all I wanted was to get as far away from San Diego as I could. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I applied to one school. I applied to Parsons. Mm-hmm. Uh, or actually, I applied to two. I applied to FIT. I tried mm-hmm. to apply to Parsons. I thought FIT was the easier one to get into. I got denied, and I got into Parsons. <laughs> okay. That's what um, I thought, too. Right. So I got into Parsons. Uh, you know, I remember, like, the second day of school, it's like orientation. Everyone goes in around and says what they're doing there. And every kid was like, I want to be a designer. 
Mm-hmm. Well, end of first year, half of those kids were gone, didn't even go to the school anymore. Any of the kids who were in fashion switched to another major. Like, it, it was amazing to me that while I dropped out of Parsons, like, none of those kids are really doing what they mm-hmm. set out to do anyways. Right. And it's like the 1% of those kids who actually figured it out. Yeah. What was your major at Parsons? Uh, so I actually went to Parsons for design and management, which was a brand new major at the time. Mm-hmm. And I thought very naively, without doing any research, of course, uh, that it was design with business mixed. As the title would of make course. you assume. <laughs> right. Yeah. But in reality, it's like... There's no design. Business with a design thinking. Yeah. And so while at the time I probably should have realized that's actually a really great thing Mm -hmm. because it's a thing you need in business, like I just was sitting in design classes being like, I'm teaching my teacher shit about Illustrator. I'm, you know, I've been self teaching myself this shit since freshman year of high school. So, like, why am I even in these classes? And Mm -hmm. there's like, it kind of like started to really turn me off the school because I was like, why can't I just skip to where I'm supposed to be? Mm-hmm. You know, like I don't need to go sit here and pay five, six thousand dollars for this class to like be in this class with a bunch of kids who aren't even ready. Was and it a difficult decision to leave school? My parents gave me the gift of saying, "We have one year for you. You can go to school, but you got to figure out how to get the rest to happen." You mean financially, we'll pay financially. For we'll help you out for the first year, uh-huh. but you're gonna have to go find scholarships and do all that if you want to finish it. Mm-hmm. And I just remember, like, you know, I applied for all these scholarships. I was applying for FITM to get a scholarship there because yeah. I felt like I couldn't get one at Parsons and like I wasn't in this bracket of like, you know, mm-hmm. money group where my parents were making a certain amount of money to do it, but my parents were in a position to continue to put me on. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it, it just kind of got to the point where I saw opportunity. I was interning downtown at Prohibit with uh, Chase Infinite. Mm-hmm. And you know, I, I looked at it as like, you know what, man, I can just fucking go for it. I mm-hmm. might as well, you know, and, uh, but what really was the defining moment was when I had met you and then the week after that. Mike mentions a quote unquote defining moment. It's a phrase that I think gets overused a bit because if you really understand what a defining moment is, you will realize it's one of the most important things that can happen in your life. And then training yourself to foresee when a defining moment might be upon you. Now you're in like X-Men mutant territory. You know Spider-Man's spidey sense when the hairs on his neck stand up for a few seconds before like a bomber explodes or trouble is about to happen? That's kind of like honing your defining moment sense. The tricky thing is though, that feeling feels eerily similar to the feeling of fear. And fear is your body's defensive mechanism to avoid getting hurt. So recognize when all the elements around you are telling you to do something and take that leap of faith. It might just be the sign that leads to a massive break. Okay, so I was going to move this whole moment, this this moment that you recall now. So looking back, you decided to quit school already. So no, I I was at the time I was interning. I thought I was going to go to FITM. I like I gotten accepted. I I got a small scholarship and. I was at Prohibit every day. I was just interning, doing graphics for them. I was doing anything I could. I remember going to like Noah Callahan Bevere's house, literally like back in the day, like to his old crib in Soho and then just like helping him design his website. Like mm-hmm. I didn't make websites, but I figured out how to make it because I wanted, I just needed some money. Mm-hmm. Like if I could buy myself a 20 sack of weed in the backwood and like get some dinner that night, it was good. Mm-hmm. You know, that was life. So, uh, you know, fast forward into all this stuff, like I was at Prohibit. I needed a job really bad and like, was Prohibit paid? Prohibit was not paid. Okay. It was... Uh, paid in weed. It was paid in weed and food. Shin <laughs> took really good care of me. Uh-huh. Chase took good care of me. I mean, you know, man, that was the most invaluable place I could have been at the time because people don't look back and realize that how many people who were doing things today or were in there. Oh, yeah, you know? totally. Um, and so... And next door to Reed Space. Literally, and next door to Reed Space. Literally I mean, next door. And Jay Scott and, and Nico J- yeah. and all these other people. I mean, look at what everyone's doing today. It's like, it's amazing to watch, mm-hmm. you know? So... I always want someone to make like a family tree. Of, like, where, where it yeah. went. You know, and like, sick. it's crazy. So, you know, I just remember like, I was just struggling. I, I knew where the staple design office was and I knew where you lived at the time, mm-hmm. uh, you know, creepily enough. <laughs> and, um, you know, I just was like, I could work for Jeff. Like he does cool stuff with Nike. He does all these other jobs, like this other design firm, like this could be how I could like do all these things. And so in my head, I was like, aha, this is how I do it. Mm. So I literally was like, I'm just going to make a poster. And I just designed this thing up 20 minutes made it, went to my Parsons print lab. I printed as much paper and fucking posters as I could. I like literally had 111 by 17 posters. I had these massive, like large format prints and I just decided to go out and put them up. Mm -hmm. So 
I on the like, path that I walked. On the path that you walked. So I was like, all right, this is like kind of probably how he walks. I just like started hitting up all these places. Mm-hmm. I, I asked Nico, like, where where would he go this day, whatever, and uh, you know, just put everything up. And um, on my way home, I remember walking to the subway, and I had the poster sticking in my bag. And the guy goes, "Hey, man, what are those?" And I'm like, "Oh yeah, man, I'm trying to get this job. Like, check out these posters, whatever." And I was all excited, like, yeah. kind of on this high of like doing this. And the dude's like, "Cool, put your hands behind your back. Uh, you're, you're getting." locked up for graffiti and essentially just put, put my hands behind my back like whole thing like went to the cop car like you had no clue he I was had, undercover I had no clue and then he got me I uh, got taken to what's called the tombs in New York in mm-hmm. Tribeca and um, is this the first time you got arrested this is the first time I got arrested I'm, and mind you I came from like a job interview earlier that day where I was wearing khakis and a button down shirt and some boat shoes and so like <laughs> I'm sitting in holdings like <laughs> like you never look like this no but the day you're in jail you yeah. look like the biggest herb ever the biggest herb I'm like <laughs> Uh, yeah, it was crazy. I got like some guy like nodding out of heroin in the corner. Another guy on the phone being like, "I swear I didn't try to stab my wife." And like, you're just like, "Dude, what am I doing here?" And like, I didn't call my parents because I'm like, "How? What, what am I going to tell them?" And so like, <laughs> I remember getting out. I tried to like, uh, I had to like go to this the actual station to get my phone. They were trying to hold it. It was like this whole thing. I finally get home two days later, 9 a.m. I like turn my phone on finally. I get on the computer. And I saw that Mecca Obi and the Hundreds had both written little articles. Uh-huh. At the About time, what happened? Right. So Mecca. Wow, in two days? Yeah. And so Mecca had gone on and at the time, Hypebeast had little blogs for everyone. I think you probably had one at the time and everyone else. And he had written a whole thing about shameless, shameless self-promotion. And at the time, I didn't think about it. I uh-huh. was like, I'm just trying to get a job. But when he wrote it out, wrote it out and like really spelled out what I had done, I was like, oh yeah, this is kind of smart. <laughs> and like, not to like, oh, he wrote it as a critical piece or as he a wrote it as like a, a nod to be like, if you really want something, go oh, out and like, get it and like hustle. go and just yeah. hustle it up and make it happen. Okay. And I think the hundreds also had said something like that as well. Mm-hmm. Whereas like, you know, we can admire like what this was and them just going after someone like, you know, with everyone just, you know, sending emails like, Hey, can I have a job? Like this was a, a new creative way yeah. of doing it. Right. And so, you know, that whole thing happened. I get out, I have that. And then, I just remember getting like an email from your assistant and she's like, hey, Jeff wants you to come in, mm-hmm. you know? And all of a sudden I'm like, oh, fuck. <laughs> and it's like, all right, this is happening. I got it. Like, it's all worth it. I did jail time, but it's yeah, worth it. You know, and like, I, I fucking was so nervous. I remember rolling in there, just fucking gut my, or like, not my stomach, whatever, and just like sat down. And I remember you look in my eyes and be like, you're not going to come in here and just design and like make t shirts. Like, you're going to have to go get coffee and do whatever and like mm-hmm. sweep and like work your way up. And like, I remember being shattered. I was like, what? <laughs> Like, dude, after all this, and I remember like calling mom and like, mom, like, I don't know what to do. Like, I, I thought this was my chance, uh-huh. and just like fucking being lost. But then, uh, yeah, two days later, funny enough, a mecca actually connects me with someone at ninety four by fifty who ends up getting me an interview with the two five five studio. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, right, they had heard the story about that, and they'd heard all these other things. And and for those who don't know, the two five five studio, just explain which what that was, was basically like uh, the first tier to like uh, what was the Bowery Stadium later is a full customization lab that was run uh, by Nike that was also curated by Doubleday and Cartwright. Uh, and they had a full like apparel customization set up inside. So, yeah. you know, sewing, embroidery, DTG, vinyl cutting, mm-hmm. everything. Um, I had kind of gotten the job because I worked at Goodwood at the time, mm-hmm. or before that, and mm-hmm. I was making laser etched jewelry, which then transferred into me making laser cut patches, laser etching sleeves of jackets, doing all these kind of things that I had never done before because I had the machine experience. It yeah. allowed me to get that job yeah. because there was no one else who knew how to use that machine. Right. It was honestly like that whole store was made for like someone who's had your experience. Exactly. And then I was in a room with a bunch of kids who were talented artists, but they weren't good graphic designers. Mm-hmm. So I quickly started like kind of finding my own little lane in there and I became like the main graphic designer guy and I figured out how to use every machine and I just like, I just try to touch as much shit as I could Mm -hmm. because if I knew that, then I can go make something. I mean, I remember coming in the first day, I had 20 blank t-shirts, I walked out with 20 shirts Yeah, and it's like, when your eyes can be open to the idea of just making something without having to go through the process of actually doing it, you know, there's no barrier to your ideas and I think that's the biggest problem with any designer in this world, there's a barrier to your idea because you think you can't go make it. Mm -hmm. Well said. Um, that 94 by 50, which is the agency for Which is Nike. Game 7 now. Yeah. Yep. That did the, the 255 space. That was a paying yep. job or an internship still? So that was a paying job. Like that okay. was like, I was getting like 21 or $22 an hour and that was like, holy shit. Like mm-hmm. I'm getting paid. You yeah. Because like, this is like the first time you're getting steady money. Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm like, holy shit. I'm getting 1300 bucks every two weeks. Like mm-hmm. this is, I'm like, I'm rolling in the dough. Mm-hmm. Like, and, you know, and you're doing 
basically what you want to do for like the dopest company. In and the world. I'm and I've dropped out of college. All my friends are in school. Mm-hmm. I'm 19 and I'm making T-shirts every day. And I technically work for Nike. Yeah. Like in, when I'm having conversations, I work for Nike. But yeah. obviously, I'm just a consultant hired mm-hmm. by an agency. But uh, <laughs> you know, at the time when you're 19, you're like, holy shit, this is so cool. And I kind of got this little like cool thing out of it. You yeah. Know? And and also that that store that Nike did was like. They got the coolest stuff. The coolest people went there. The coolest people, the coolest yeah. things. Like they brought in like Amari Stoudemire. And I would sit down and like help like mock up the jacket or like, you know, they brought in like Ronnie back in the day. And this is actually how I met Ronnie is that Ronnie came in to do a jacket. I ended up being the graphic design guy mocking it up. And he was like, yo, man, you're so fast. And then all of a sudden I met Soho House with him designing the Kith Just Us logos, all of it. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, looking back at that, I'm like, I'm getting paid a thousand dollars a month at Kith to do freelance graphic design. And then now fast forward, I'm like, oh shit. I designed the branding for a fucking multi-million dollar like conglomerate, which now is going to have stores across the world. And it's like, damn, you know, I can kind of take a step back and be like, that's awesome. Did you design the Kith logo? Yeah. The one in the box? Yes. Oh, wow. Yeah. Damn. Did Just Us, did the flag, did like all the first sneaker clouds. I worked on the whole East Coast project when he did the whole Miami thing. Uh Um, You know, it it was... Why don't more people know that? Because Ronnie is... Well, I mean, I I think Ronnie and I are cool. I mean, hey, if you ever hear this, Ronnie, we're good. But, uh, you know, I think like um, when I started ICNY and I kind of had that idea, Ronnie saw it and he wanted to bring it in to make like a Kith capsule collection Mm -hmm. out of some reflective stuff. And he's like, this is amazing. I made like this crazy polka dot all over jacket. It was nuts. Um, But at the time I'm like, no, this is like, I wanted to like it to be my thing. And Mm -hmm. I remember I like made this partnership with a company called IRT, which was my investor in ICNY. And I had brought Kith in for a meeting to make some accessories and other stuff. And I remember him seeing me and then him pulling me aside after and be like, dude, why didn't you ask me to invest into it? And I just remember being like, dude, you never told me any, like you weren't interested in investing in it. You wanted to make it into a, a thing, you mm-hmm. know? And I think uh, like everyone always will come to you after. I've, I've learned this in life of like, you know, everyone's like, I, I would have done this or I, I, to- I should have told you this or yeah. whatever, but it's, it's always a little bit too late, you know, right, or right. whatever. So, um, you know, I think uh, mut- like, Massive respect for the dude, and I think he's built something amazing. And mm-hmm. you know, it's just crazy to see how far it's come from like us sitting at Soho House before they even had an office yeah. to what it is now. Right. You know, it's it's amazing. There's an infamous story that Nike's founder Phil Knight paid a graphic designer by the name of Carolyn Davidson a whole thirty-five dollars for her swoosh logo design back in 1971. And now discovering that Mike designed the Kith branding reminds me a little of that. Imagine Carolyn Davidson, instead of charging $35, said to Phil Knight, no upfront fee, but pay me half a penny every time you use the swoosh logo. Phil might have actually gone for that deal. So when negotiating your fees with any kind of work, tread carefully. What's the upside potential of working with this person? Should I take all the money now and run or work on a longer term relationship? I think it's all worked out for Mike, but it's very interesting to hear this anecdote nonetheless. Another part of the story that Mike tells is when Ronnie Feig asked him why he didn't come to him to be his partner on ICNY. Business owners, entrepreneurs, and brand founders, especially in the street and sneaker market, are usually very prideful and egocentric. In a good way, of course. So it's often hard to let your guard down and say, hey, I need your help. I mean, what if Mike asked Ronnie to help him with ICNY? Where would the brand be today? You never know, guys. Your greatest ally and partner could be sitting next to you right now. You just got to ask. So you started a brand called ICNY, as you mentioned. Tell us, you're at 255 working at Nike. What's the impetus for then deciding to do this thing? So I would write, I got myself like deep into like track by culture. One of the guys who worked there is a guy named Track Greer. Um... He sold me his old Bianchi frame. I ended up uh, just like just getting deep into it, man. Mm-hmm. I was just like riding every day, rain, sleet, snow, whatever. It was I was riding. Your so, addictive personality kicked in. Yes, and like <laughs> I loved that feeling. Every morning I'd come in fucking like half sweaty to work, and I'd just like this is my thing. You know, yeah. just doing the skid stops. The whole the whole like track bike thing in New York is a thing. Mm-hmm. Like if you don't live in New York, you don't understand. Yeah. Or if you live in SF, sure. But mm-hmm. I think the hills are crazy. <laughs> uh, but. That kind of like led me into all this because riding my bike, I would inherently get into car accidents because I loved running red lights. I loved doing dumb shit. I loved going fast. And I would get hit by cars. I got doored by taxis. I got T-boned. I like, you know, I just been through the ringer of it. And I think like 
it was after one of my accidents where I was doored by a taxi and the dude could have clearly seen me if I wasn't just wearing all black. I was like, I might as well just put some reflective on some stuff. So, you know, came into the studio the next day. We had the, two, a, the Nike studio. Yep. Okay. We had a vinyl cutter and a heat press and a roll of reflective. Mm-hmm. I just literally started cutting polka dots out because I was like, let's make some polka dot socks. Yeah. And literally just took a pair of Nike socks, pressed them on, and that was my first pair of socks. Mm-hmm. And then from there, I went and got like the Nike like SB coaches jacket that was non-branded and I just started pressing like massive polka dots on the sleeves and I did the chest and the back and you right. know I just started thinking about like where's the most important place for it to be and I just started like applying it everywhere mm-hmm. and then as that was happening Nike released the Olympic flash jacket yeah and Which that was all like, 3M all 3M yeah. and that was like the first time that any of these brands had done like a full on polarizing jacket like mm-hmm. that and they had done the running hat with the perforation and they did all these crazy items and that shit just opened my mind up to everything I was like holy shit this is like way more than just workwear. It's way more than any of that. It's something bigger. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, it just, uh, at the time, it was like, oh shit, like this is something bigger. This is actually of a purpose. And yeah. I had always made clothing, but it never meant anything. Mm-hmm. Like we all make shit, but like, what does it mean? Right. What's it for? And this was the first time it actually meant something to me and was actually impactful. Mm. So when you did the sock, did you already have the brand name in your head or you were literally just making stuff? So funny enough, like I had went and you know the first name of the brand was ice cold new york um and i started the website i had the instagram the whole thing and then all of a sudden like a month or two months in my friends at look studio where i was actually running this whole thing out of um their friends had a framing store called ice cold frames turned out like an art framing store art framing store but they they made some t-shirts before you know and uh you know, I just like reached out to the guys. I was like, hey, like, I see you guys have the trademark. Like, just want to see, like, would you be willing and, you know, willing to sell it to me, whatever. I see you guys haven't been using it. And they just like, one guy was like, fuck off, you know, and just like, <laughs> I just remember the time, like, my investor just being like, well, we can't do this then. Like, I, I can't not have a trademark. So we uh-huh. quickly had to go to the drawing board and all of a sudden Ice Cold New York got turned into ICNY as okay. an acronym of Ice Cold New York. Well, you mentioned investors. So back up and talk about the investment. Hmm. So, uh, I started ICNY really as like all DIY handmade. Mm-hmm. I literally was buying blanks from all, uh, American Apparel. They were making these like, you know, like moisture wicking t-shirts and I was buying like, I was literally going to Uniqlo and buying like 50 pairs of black socks from them and then like heat pressing them. Mm-hmm. Um, like it was all hand done. For mm-hmm. sale? Yes. Okay. So I was buying those socks at like $3 a pair and mm-hmm. I was selling them for 12 to 15, mm-hmm. you know? And like looking back, it was probably a dumb idea, but you know, it was like all these things where that's how it started. Yeah. Um, very quickly, I see why I gathered a, like a good amount of attention just purely out of it being like a, a valid idea. Mm-hmm. I felt like it, mm-hmm. it just had a purpose. It wasn't just another thing. Yeah. And so, you know, fast forward a little bit, starts getting some attention. I start getting some good retailers and then Colette picks it up. Mm-hmm. Um, Colette comes in, basically we do a collaborative t-shirt, uh, sells out. I mean, that kind of opened up everything else. Mm. So how does Colette discover I see NY. You know what's funny is, uh, like, I don't talk about it much. There was, like, this random guy I met, uh, this guy Rashid, through another person named Giovanni, who was involved with 40 Ounce Van back in the day, this real small kid. Mm-hmm. Um, there was, like, a lot of people who tried to jump in early on ICNY and basically come in and try to, like, take a piece of it from me. Hmm. And, uh, like, take a piece meaning I want to give you money to be involved? No. Like, <laughs> like when I was going to get the investment, a guy named. I tried to come in and he wanted 20% of the company. Mm-hmm. And I was like, my investor was like, so what does he do? And like, you know, naively I was told like he does logistics. I was like, cool. Yeah. He does logistics. He helps with the marketing. I, you know, the investor was like, so what he does shipping. Mm-hmm. And I was like, no. And he was like, so what marketing does he do? I was like, well, I can send it to Hypebeast myself. He doesn't send it out. Like, he's like, cool. Well then he doesn't need 20% of the company. Mm-hmm. And it was like a, a quick, easy thing. And so yeah. we had like offered him a, a salary and, uh, he basically just said fuck off and then tried to send some angry lawyer letters and so were these like friends because i know like in these startup brands there's like a lot of friends hanging around and so there's like if there's a guy in the office that's working with you and throwing you ideas they all of they're, a sudden think they're so they weren't in my office and these are people who were like around who i think at times like i'd meet them and then we'd have a conversation and they'd be like i can help you and i'd be like cool i need some help mm-hmm. and nothing would ever like materialize mm-hmm. but they would always want to make a deal and then and then let it materialize. Okay. And it's like, cool, well, I, I can't give you anything here. And okay. nothing ever really happened. But the collect connection really just happened out of a guy like connecting me with someone on an email. Mm-hmm. And then them liking it. And Sarah being like, this is cool. Let's pick it up. Mm-hmm. You know? Okay. 
yeah, I mean, the craziest thing is that the Chinatown one, I literally just sent her a cold email two years later after not talking to her, and she sent me a text reply and sent me an order. You know, so it's <laughs> yeah, like she's the best. The way that they run, like I, I mean, like it was amazing. I, I know. Like, you know, like it, especially it, when you know she's doing the same thing to like Balenciaga and yeah. like Celine. I'm just like, <laughs> how is that? How even, is that possible? Yeah. yeah, it just it can't be. Yeah, so. Um, so what, what other stores were you selling in like locally, like in locally, America? like, you know, I think we had sold a little bit to Reed space. We had sold a little bit to Kith. Like we had mm-hmm. sold like a, you know, we had started to do that and then quickly it jumped right into urban uh, outfitters. Yes. Okay. Urban outfitters. and urban had opened up a whole section called without walls and mm-hmm. without walls was their whole like active outdoor thing, which perfect for us was an exact retailer. What I want, what I wanted to be. Yeah. But the. I think, and not to jump it around a hundred things, but I think the inherent problem of us jumping that far that quick is that our product did not match the quality of what it was aspiring to be. Mm-hmm. So like for me to go make a technical running tight or for me to go make running shorts or even just a regular t-shirt, yeah. there's gotta be properties to it. Right. If it's just a regular cotton t-shirt, I got emails left and right of like, this shit's so wet, it's this, it doesn't work. It's like, you know, like I remember even like saying my socks were technical and like, they're not technical. Mm-hmm. Like, let's be real. Like, I couldn't use merino wool. I wouldn't be able to afford it. Like, yeah. it, it was all the the little things where I was selling the idea of technicality, mm-hmm. right? You know, but I wasn't executing on it. Yeah, you know, and you can't really catch up to the big boys like Nike and all that after one season, right? And so, how far or how big did you get ICNY before the investment happened? I, I'd probably say it was like uh, ten retailers, fifteen retailers, mm-hmm. and then I had gotten a sales rep. Um, who um, she worked in like the bike world and she really started ramping it up. And I think when she got on is when it really took that next step. And what's funny is that guy actually made that connection into IRT Mm -hmm. and I ended up getting connected to IRT because he wanted me to help him with all the other shit he did. So, you know, BBC and all these other things that he was servicing because he does all the printables for Supreme. He does all their accessories. He does all these different things. So how would you describe what IRT does? IRT stands for in record time. In record time. It's a glorified middleman because essentially they're just helping companies connect with ASI vendors who essentially have promotional product goods, Mm -hmm. which they're then printing on. So they're doing a lot of pad printing, screen printing. They just make it easy for you like if you don't know how to go do these things they'll go do it for you right. and they'll build a 30 percent profit on top mm-hmm. you know? so essentially just for the people who are listening or aren't clear on this like when you see let's say a lighter with your yeah. favorite brand's logo on it maybe the brand doesn't need to call the lighter company they call a company like irt who handles all the messy stuff exactly and you just send your logo and he gives you the lighter, and you tell him it looks shitty it looks good and yeah. me, get me another sample so right. it takes the risk off of people which is mm-hmm. great but at the same time it's like you're just paying sometimes for someone to do yeah. the job that you probably could do right so and little yeah. known fact but every supreme accessory literally nunchucks right fire extinguisher it's probably more about like 80 percent, but yeah okay. like he doesn't make all of it he makes he makes 80 percent like of them yeah. and i mean every season they're giving him a full pitch of it all and you know basically saying hey shows what you can make mm-hmm. so you know great business there he's built up with james since like 94 95 or whatever yeah um and they so been, he has so irt is a big company yeah it's and a big then, company yeah. and then so he reached out to you just for help first. it was really that i think like he saw a little bit of the potential that he could help me in helping to finance and give myself like a salary and to get me a little bit more set up to mm-hmm. run a brand and then he conversely was like i want you to help me with bbc and all these other things that i have inside already mm-hmm. that right now like at the time when i came in he did not have like cool designers or young people to be able to be like hey we're going to pitch bbc on this this stuff yeah you know so so on paper that seems like a good arrangement it was great i was getting paid fifty thousand dollars a year i thought i was good but then what i had signed myself into was a non-compete which essentially made it so that i couldn't work with anyone else outside of him mm-hmm. and i couldn't work on anything but the brand which mm-hmm. in theory is great because you're focused on the brand yeah. but when you lock yourself down into a single salary and a single income mm-hmm. you put yourself into a pretty fixed situation yeah so what happened how long did that last before it started to go downhill I think it was about two and a half, three years. Okay. Uh, you know, did all the trade shows. I've done multiple trips to Asia, to factories. I mean, mind you, came into the situation with this guy and, you know, he sold me the whole idea of having global sourcing and, you know, production. Well, I, go, I had to go find my first production person. And then the second person we found and then we had to get rid of and then we got another one, mm-hmm. you know, but it, they didn't have a production setup. They didn't do global sourcing. Mm-hmm. Like they had made some stuff for some people, but it doesn't mean they've ever run a brand. Right. And that was the thing. They've always serviced brands, but never built a brand. Mm-hmm. So, you know, coming into the whole situation, I looked at it as like, cool, like I'm about to have the infrastructure so that I can just go focus on design yeah. and then they can handle the business. But the infrastructure wasn't actually there. There was never infrastructure. Mm-hmm. And it was literally like, Mike, go design, 
we'll go make it and then we'll just go sell it. Mm-hmm. But there was never any thought in between that to be like, let's structure some merchandising. Let's structure everything else. Like, let's make sure that it's smart in yeah. how it's built. I kind of just had the license to go do what I wanted. Hearing this tale firsthand from Mike is amazing. I'm not placing judgment on who was right or who was wrong. As you know, there's two sides to every story, and I'm sure Mike's partner has a very different opinion on how it all went down. But hearing it from the brand founder is really invaluable and rare. Hopefully, as you are building something, you'll get interest from outside people to either help or consult or invest. We always hear about the overnight success stories, but we rarely hear these stories, the flops. Mike got caught in a bad partnership situation. And as you'll soon hear, it would cost him the entire brand that he birthed, and he'd have to start all over again. So in those two years, the first two years that you're sort of, you know, you just signed the partnership, is it going well? Is it like, is sales going up as you expected? Is the product getting better as you would hope? You know, the sales were going up each year. But the production costs were also doubling mm-hmm. each year. Um, as well, like, you know, things were going well. But in that process, it was like I had to learn how to put reflective onto socks, which is not an easy thing to do. Mm-hmm. Without a research and development team, without product development, anything. I remember flying to Asia the first time and trying to teach these guys how to put reflective onto socks. I didn't have a translator, I didn't have anything. Mm-hmm. I was in the middle of Seoul without one person to talk to and trying to use my hands and like pictures to show how to make the socks. Yeah. You know, it took two trips for us to perfect it. Mm-hmm. It was, it was. So it's expensive. It was expensive, yeah. you know, and like a lot of that learning process and building it, 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 it was debilitating for the brand. Mm-hmm. You know, like we didn't have the luxury of the research to be able to perfect it, and so I think like I would try to go make like a technical like waterproof jacket, and we just couldn't get the factory to do the tape seams because this factory would make diamond supply and you know black black scale owns the brands, but like they weren't doing technical apparel, mm-hmm. and so like I remember our our last season we got like three or four styles that had a 100% damage rate because they had just incorrectly used the reflective, but the factory was not willing to take any responsibility because they never had experience with it before. And so it wasn't like this is like their specialty, Mm -hmm. you know? And it's just all those kind of things that had happened and Mm -hmm. it just was like, it was horrible for the brand. And how much of your time was spent on the other brands that IRT was handling? You know, as it went on, he kind of just had me focus 100% on Mm ICNY, which was great, but I'd always kind of bounce in and just kind of give him my opinion. We'd always be talking and... You know, like in some vein, it was it was good because we were constantly working to build this thing. But inherently, what ended up happening is is like you have this guy with money who wants to build a brand, but all he really wants to do is just like just kind of be on the the throne, watching it all happen. But the reality is, you got to roll up your sleeves and get in there with us. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, there was there was never a brand manager. There was never any kind of like structure to do anything. Mm-hmm. And as I can take responsibility for not creating that structure. I had never done it before. Mm-hmm. So it was really me coming in trying to just do what I thought was right. Yeah. And the only thing I had done is make DIY t-shirts. Right. So, you know. Um, and in retrospect, would, do you wish that you just kept it all to yourself? In retrospect, I got paid to go to college. So in that respect, after any of the fucked up things that had happened and whatever with our relationship, I can sit back and say, hey, you paid me for college. Thank mm-hmm. you. Mm-hmm. School you know? of Hard Knocks, right? School of Hard Knocks, yeah. you know. I got to travel to Asia. I learned about culture. I learned about people. I met people that I would never have met if I didn't travel. Uh-huh. Um, and I fostered friendships and business relationships that I would never have without it. Right. So, you know, regardless of any of my personal feelings towards the situation or, you know, whatever, I'm grateful for that. Mm-hmm. What was the um, equity split of ICNY? So at first, I owned the brand. Mm-hmm. I think it was like 60-40. Mm-hmm. And then about a year in, uh, I remember him coming up to me uh, and he actually had the lawyer do it, which was actually our lawyer. Um, and uh, she basically was like, yeah, so like, um, you know, Adam's putting in a million dollars so far. Like, he'd really feel comfortable if he just had like controlling stake in it so that he could just, you know, just n- know that his money's in the right place. And I was at the time I'm like, yeah, I'm just building a brand. This is cool. Like, whatever. Like, I, it's going to be big. Like, I'm not worried about it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I ended up giving him controlling ownership of the brand mm-hmm. um, what that ended up doing is just putting me in a position where he could do whatever he wanted mm-hmm. I was in in effect his employee of IRT and I was just the creative director mm-hmm. of my own brand right but I did not technically own that brand mm-hmm. so and you owned a minority share at this point and I owned a minority share so do you feel like that was a chess move 
it was a chess move early on. Yeah, like which, when you think three steps ahead, like totally. chess move. Right. And he was way ahead of me, mm-hmm. you know? I wasn't smart enough to think about it like right, that. Right. In, in reality, I could have just checked him and been like, you want it? You can pay for it, mm-hmm. you know? But at the time, I thought I was just doing the right thing. Yeah. Be good to people, right. you know? So fast forward, um, we end up getting a consultant probably three years into the brand. And, um, you know, at first I'm like, this is great. We got a guy coming in. He's going to like help us get it together, brand manager, get the structure right. Mm-hmm. I remember like two weeks after he comes in, I end up going on like an Asia tour and we go to like Lane Crawford's and all these other stores across Asia do customization events and it was a whole marketing tour. Yeah. I remember like halfway through, like just getting this weird tone of things and like uh, him being like, I don't know why you're out there, blah, blah, blah. And then like I get back and I quickly realize that the shit hit the fan and he's basically decided that I'm the problem. Mm-hmm. in the whole thing the, which the, the consultant the consultant mm-hmm. so you know I'll take responsibility for plenty of the things that I had no experience with and I think this I had a total part in the brand not succeeding but uh, basically just you know decided that I was a problem and I need to be removed mm. so um, you know all of a sudden I noticed that my password to my email had changed and that was in the middle of me sitting in the office and they had all been in a meeting without me and so oh I basically God. grab my computer, I grab like <clears throat> a few things, put it into a bag, dip out of there, and then I get an email uh, from Adam basically being like, hey, I come in for, I want to talk to you. He's like, and then he's like, oh, where, where'd you go? And then I just realized like, like they sort of started taking everything. Mm-hmm. So I had like taken home samples, I had taken all this shit. He has a lawyer send me a letter basically being like, you have stolen from me, blah, 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 like return all these goods. Blah, blah. Like, it was just like a mess. I was, like, he wanted me to return the computer immediately. He wanted me to return all these things. And mm-hmm. in my head, I'm like, it's, it's my computer. Like, yes, you got it for me, but like, this is like what I've worked off after the past three years. Yeah. So I had to like, go scramble, go get a computer. I had to go like figure out what the fuck I was going to do. Mm-hmm. I started, I went on unemployment. Like, and then I got a lawyer because I was like, what am I going to do? And like, I didn't know how I could protect myself, how I could do any of these things. And it just kind of fizzled out. Yeah. You know, nothing happened. So. Right. Well, you, you went know, into, um, there was a long sort of length of litigation, right? Yeah. You know, it, it never. Was you, tr- it, you tried to get the brand back. You know, I, if I had thought about actually buying the brand back, mm-hmm. like I was thinking about it at the time being like, cool, like I'm just going to buy this brand back at a new investor. Like I had a guy who was going to go buy the brand and. Uh, we were going to do it. But in my head, I was like, I'm not giving this guy the money because mm-hmm. it's just giving him money back. Like, that's it. Yeah. I'm just going to go and do something new. Mm-hmm. Like, fuck this guy. Yeah. You know, and I, I didn't want to, I didn't want him to be made whole for how he had treated me in that moment. Right. You know, someone who I'd thought was my business friend, which mm-hmm. we all know business is business and friends are friends. I learned that one very easily. Yeah. But it was like, damn, he was able to flip a, flip a hat real quick on me. Mm. You know, went from being cool with me, talking to me to like, I remember him just saying to me on the phone being like, Cause like he had just like totally cut me off, like no next paycheck. And uh, I was like, you really can't even give me like this next two weeks or whatever. And he's just like, it's just business. You know, I remember like him saying that. I was like, damn, that's cold, you know, but yeah. that will always stick with me, you mm-hmm. know, and I'll never forget that shit. But it's funny cause little does he know, I still work on projects that he's involved in that he has no idea. Yeah. So, you know, I like to keep it like that. I think inherently I was also young, immature and mm-hmm. emotional. So like any young, immature, emotional designer is going to feel some type of way about what he makes yeah. and what he does. And I think like, man, critiquing was hard, fucking baking product and then having someone tell you it sucks is hard. Mm-hmm. Like all those things that I had to go through, like I'm glad I went through it now because now it's a lot easier to hear it. Yeah. You know, but I will acknowledge that my mistakes in these processes were not just being more level headed and not being as emotional and realizing that. I'm not making this stuff for me. I'm mm. making it for fucking thousands of people out there who are the consumers. Yeah. We're all human. We all make mistakes. The important thing is to learn why that mistake happened and be able to correct it from happening in the future. Mike mentions that he was paid to go to school, the school of hard knocks. So he's looking at the silver lining in this otherwise tumultuous relationship. But more importantly, you can hear in his voice that he's reflected on his actions from the past he knows he was at least partially responsible for the downfall of ICNY. Self-realization, critique, reflection. These are big boy lessons that Mike got a crash course in. And if you can have that attitude, you can walk away from a big loss with at least a small W. And ICNY actually ended up doing a really dope collaboration with Puma too. Yep, so we had done the three releases with Puma over the year 2015. Um, and, and that was while you were partners with IRT. And that was still while I was partners with IRT. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that was a huge opportunity. Yeah. Um, 
getting to just touch footwear and be able to do products, do a pop-up shop. Like I, you know, dreamed of shit like that. Mm -hmm. Um, but like, I also remember like getting a pop-up and literally buying all the merch for it and being like, all right, so we just bought like 30 K in merch. We're going to make like $200,000 in this like three weeks. Didn't happen. Mm -hmm. You know, like I remember like the first day of the pop-up shop, I thought there'd be a few kids outside. There was one kid outside. He had Mm -hmm. taken the train from DC all the way to the pop-up shop. But like, I felt like a fucking idiot because I'm like, damn, this is one kid out here lined up to buy shit. It was so sad. But, um, but yeah, it was never like that hype brand. It was never any of those things, Mm -hmm. but, uh, it was a great experience, man. And I think it was, it was the shaper for me to understand how to make real clothes. Yeah. Cause I have a lot of friends who sit on Photoshop and just mock up shit and like, you know, they don't have any understanding of what it takes to actually make something mm-hmm. for real. Yeah. It's like, we can all make t-shirts. We can all make all this other shit. This is like an exercise of fun. Right. But like when you go make a great executed garment, there's nothing like it. Mm-hmm. You know, I yeah. think we all know what it's like to put on a fucking acronym jacket or put on some of these pieces where you're like, this was really thought through, mm-hmm. you know? And yeah. It's like, when you have that appreciation and understanding, then you just, you, you, it's it's like that higher level of consciousness in clothing, mm-hmm. you know? It's almost like you break through that barrier of like, why would I ever spend $800 on this Gucci item or any of these other things? It's like, because sometimes there's an appreciation for what was done here and what was made. Yeah. I don't care what it costs. I think sometimes it's about what, what was done in the process of making it. Right. So. Um, I talk to a lot of young entrepreneurs and they always ask me the question of like, should I go it on my own or should I bring in a partner? Um, what's your advice when you get to ask that question? I'm in the process right now of actually bringing back uh, ICNY under a new moniker uh, with a partner. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that people just have to sit back and acknowledge what it is they're trying to build. Because I don't think I was wrong by getting a partner for ICNY because I thought that ICNY's idea was bigger than me. And mm-hmm. I believe that if I just tried to build it, I wouldn't be able to build it fast enough. Mm-hmm. Which if I was trying to do it myself, I was like trying to make cut and soap blanks and like you know, Midtown, New York, like it wasn't happening. It yeah. was like absolute shit. And uh, I would never have been able to figure out how to make that stuff in time before the trend had just blown past me. Yeah. And so I say, if you can do it yourself, do it yourself. If you can get mm-hmm. yourself to the point where you can't afford it anymore, you know, but if you want to really go make like a fashion brand and like make cut and sew apparel and it costs money, mm-hmm. it costs, costs money to play. So you know, it's, it really comes down to like what you're trying to build and the magnitude of what you're trying to do it as. Yeah. You know? So you don't think you getting a partner for ICNY was wrong. The, the partner maybe was wrong. The partner itself was probably wrong yeah. because it could have been a way better structured partner where if they already had the distribution, the warehousing, like they didn't even have warehousing. They didn't have like any of these things. And mm-hmm. so like when the, we had to like teach the warehouse how to ship clothing, like, you know, it's like things like that where it shouldn't be like that. It yeah. should not be like that when you're like trying to sell me on this whole thing. Yeah. So, you know, for me, it's like, yeah, like it, it's either that it's a super big idea or it's very personal to you and you can run it yourself. Mm-hmm. Like I literally am able to essentially operate Chinatown Market with a few freelance, you know, designers and some people who can help me out with packing orders and, and shooting shit. Yeah. You know? Did you ever get yourself into debt prior to the investment? Like, so were you I mean, I was always in debt during like having a partner. <laughs> You're you were just know? always in debt. <laughs> because like the reality was living in New York City, my rent was fifteen hundred bucks a month, plus utilities, plus food, all this other shit and like no, it's just like that shit adds up. Mm-hmm. You know, you end up living check to check for three years. It's not really good life. And then not to mention buying blanks and inks and exactly. Transfers. But then like, you know, obviously when I had the investor, I didn't have to buy all that shit. I just was living my life. But, you know, you get pretty stuck into that because mm-hmm. it's like that's all you know. You're not going to see another check. And I just, you know, remember moving to California because that was like it was to me the only place where people were giving me work. I remember I went on like a two-week trip after I lost ICNY. I flew to Vancouver to work with People Footwear. I worked. I flew to, um, to California and I worked with like Pleasures and a few other people and I just like, I remember I got to California and I got like four jobs in a week mm. and I made like $10,000 and I was like, holy shit, you know? I just made like a fifth of my whole salary that I got at ICNY mm-hmm. to do an entire brand, to be an entire creative director, to build this whole thing. And I just made that in four days. Mm-hmm. So maybe I should move out here. You know, my girlfriend hated me for it. Like, uh, I just like, kind of just got up and left. Yeah. Well, um, losing your brand is an emotional dream. Yeah. I mean, dude, I remember I just sat in my house and like smoked weed for like a week and then just like didn't talk to anyone. I was mm-hmm. like so depressed. I just didn't know what to do. I was like, questioning myself, my creativity, all that. And yeah. Yeah. I mean, fuck, man. It, 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 it humbled me to a, in a, to a great extent, mm-hmm. but it was also the best experience of my life. Yeah. Cause not now going through that, I fucking have felt the bottom of the bottom. Mm-hmm. Right. So you can say whatever the fuck you want to me. It's yeah. like, it's not going to ruin my life. Right. Right. You know, um, there's yeah. something to be said about, um, and I think we're biased because we sort of like were raised in New York, 
But there's something to be said about the New York hustle. And then when you apply that same hustle to another part of the country or world. Yeah. Uh, it's, like, I, it's like when I moved to California, I remember I got to the office, I had my desk set up within a day, I had my heat press out there, I fucking was already pumping. And like people were like, dude, you already have an office? You got an apartment already? You got a car already? Right. Like it's like I didn't have it's not like I had the money to just go and go do it, but like I figured out an office space, five hundred dollars a month, like you know, I figured it out. Like I had a friend who got me like his extra bedroom and I was paying a low amount of month, amount for rent and it just kind of got me off off the ground. And mm-hmm. then I just started doing like flocking tees for people with my vinyl cutter and my heat press. And, you know, I was just hustling whatever I could. Yeah. I started doing freelance for Publish. I was doing shit for that brand Supers and they were doing. I was helping out two other companies. Like I just started getting on retainers and it just like pulled me right out of debt. And boom, all of a sudden Chinatown started exploding. Mm. Went into Urban, got some good t-shirt POs and... It just started pumping from all angles. Yeah. Okay. So, so where, let's slow yeah. down here. So you're you're helping out some brands here and there. Yeah. Right. And then um, tell us about like in your head, you had pre Chinatown. There's like an inkling of like you want to start something else, right? So because I mean, you could have just gone on and been. It sounded like a pretty financially successful freelancer. Probably, yeah. yeah. And like that's what I was trying to do. I okay. mean, like I designed uh, the New York Marathon T-shirts for Nike and like got a few of those projects, um, but. I just remember like being in the car driving to the office with this guy Vlad from Pleasures and he just looked at me he's like dude you really want to be sitting at home while we go to Japan and we do pop-up shops we do all this cool shit like go make something and I just was like fuck like and I would be like dude I just don't want to just go make something I want to make something impactful like I see why it was so important to me blah 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 and he's like dude fuck that just go make something mm-hmm. and then two days later I got a call from Alex Sports and he's like hey let's make a fuck you fucking fuck shirt and you know it just all kind of spawned from there mm-hmm. so it's it's like uh, that kind of like desperation feeling has always kind of like sparked this extra hustle for me. It's like that kind of like extra push and that nos to the creativity of like just being able to do shit, Mm -hmm. you know? And uh, I mean, it just started off with like the fuck you fucking fuck shirt. And then all of a sudden it was like the thank you bag idea. Mm -hmm. And then it was the shirt shirt idea of putting the New York shirt on a shirt. And then it was just like, this is fucking funny. We got to keep on going. And it was like bootleg Pink Panther on a t-shirt. And I was like afraid I was going to get sued for that. And I did like the Kim Kardashian shirt, which was like her from the New York Post when she got robbed in Mm -hmm. Paris. And it's like all those things. I was just like, this is fucking perfect. It's like commentary, easy graphic. It's kind of like this like punk attitude to streetwear where it's like, I'm not following any fucking rules. Mm -hmm. Like me or don't. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of how you approach it. But is is the goal, or I should, I'm going to back up and say while you were making those designs, was the goal like, I'm going to build like a multi-million dollar brand I'm going to retire off of? No, I just got a free booth for ComplexCon and I was like, I'm going to make some t-shirts. Okay. You know, like we had an opportunity and mm-hmm. I was like, cool, this is a chance for me to make a little bit of money. Like maybe it'll do well. Mm-hmm. You know, like, I didn't know. I had no idea. And I, I think well, I put in, do well. yeah, I put in like, I think I spent $3,000 in production and I, we ended up doing like fourteen dollars to $15,000 in sales mm-hmm. off of like a brand new brand that never existed before. And then we did an online release and then matched that online after a high piece drop. And, you know, from there I was like, oh shit, I hit up a, gar- a guy at Urban and I was like, hey dude, let's put it in there. Mm-hmm. I don't care. You know? And, and they was, took it. Yeah, and they took it. Uh-huh. Because the reality is, is that while many people sit out there and they're like, oh, your brand dies when you go to Urban or your brand, this is like, cool. Enjoy making no money for the rest of your life. Be cool. That's great. Fuck off. Like you and me do not align as far as business goes. And like, go be cool somewhere else because I don't give a fuck about your opinion. Like, that's how I feel about people when they're like, oh, this brand has died when it's gone to this place. It's like, no, I'm being smart in business and I'm building something bigger Mm -hmm. than what you can think about. Because if people want someone to be small forever, they just, it's it's like wanting a rap artist to never grow or to be big. It's like, you have to let someone grow and you got to let this shit be big. Yeah. Like I saw a comment today saying like, oh, they're in Urban and Zoomies now, so they must be dead. I'm like, I've been in Urban and Zoomies since the first season. Mm -hmm. So like, if I'm dead, I've been dead since day one. <laughs> totally, you know? yeah. It's like you know shit, and yeah. like, come on, it's like you run a clothing business. I know that Selfish is a cool guy clothing business, but mm-hmm. like, come on, yeah, really? You don't have that understanding of the streetwear business, uh-huh. you know? Yeah, it's like it's just kind of mind blowing to me sometimes. Wait, right? another clothing owner said that? Yes, and it's just like it's like, come on, really? Yeah, like yes, I know you own a boutique shop and you guys have a few stores, and that that's like your thing, but like you can't. Dis- rec- like not recognize what that bigger thing is mm-hmm. you know like how many fucking brands are built on those fucking infrastructures right, you know right. and the analogy of like a, a musician yeah blowing up it's like I feel like you just want that musician to play a solo show for you all the time exactly <laughs> it's just like yeah god forbid they get on MTV or something yeah so yeah. you know that kind of stuff I mean it just kind of uh, 
it always kind of like disappoints me about this industry because it's like we're all here to do business anyways mm -hmm. you know like if we want, want to fucking play this cool game like uh, we can go back to high school you know? yeah so well there's a there's like a dichotomy between the art and like you know we're creatives and artists yeah and which then we're also businessmen which i can appreciate because i'm like there's other guys out there who run like stray rats ignore prayers like all these people who like i get a lot of flack from sometimes where you know like i'm friendly with these dudes mm -hmm. but at the same time they probably look at me and they're like he doesn't understand the culture he doesn't pay homage like he doesn't know about shit it's like i know about plenty of things i just mm -hmm. sometimes i'm not going to do it the same way as you and i'm not just going to tippy toe around it just because i think that there's like this boundary of respect that needs to be had yeah because if i don't do it someone else is going to do mm -hmm. it and that boundary of respect for some reason is tends to correlate to the amount of money you make yes like it's it's almost like if you make too much money the boundary dies and you you become not cool yeah exactly and it's like at the same time when you look at things like kith where it's like this thing is blown up pretty damn big and he's allowed to be cool you know he's hated by half of the fucking yeah, industry yeah but the reality is he has that other half that loves him and mm -hmm. reveres him. Mm -hmm. But that's just the name of the game. Like, yeah. you're not going to be loved by everyone. And I think inherently with Chinatown Market, people half hate me because it's fucking working. Mm -hmm. Right. You know? Be mad at me. Yeah. Be mad you didn't think of it first. You know? Street culture is one of the strangest industries of consumer goods out there. If you started any other business in the world, and let's say Walmart calls and says, we want you in all our stores, you'd be popping bottles and celebrating. But for a streetwear brand, that's a mission critical decision. It boils down to this term of selling out. Now selling out in hip hop terms meant selling out your friends or not being true to your crew. But selling out in street culture means you've made too much money. Supreme's recent billion dollar valuation from the Carlisle Investment Group is the best case example of that. The moment the deal was done, the brand was written off by so many people. Isn't that what the founders of Supreme wanted? Or no, they wanted to stay broke and grimy and cool the whole time. The key is trying to find that perfect balance between culture and commerce, art and science, cash and craft. Uh, I don't know if this is Chinatown, but like the Frank Ocean. Mm, this is a fun one. Yeah. Is, was that under Chinatown? So when I when we did that Frank Ocean shirt, uh, it was I literally went and bought swooshfrankocean.com. Okay. I was like, I'm going to get sued for this shit. Like, I don't want it to be associated with Chinatown. I thought Chinatown would be its own brand and like this thing. I didn't think of it already as like this bootleg vehicle and like all this other shit that I could do with it. And so we made swooshfrankocean.com. I literally like built out all the graphics because like, I had gone to ComplexCon and we had sold like 40 or 50 shirts and like to me I'm like holy shit like that was the best selling shirt at the whole show I might so if well. this is a shirt with a swoosh and, and instead it, of N-I-K-E it says it's just Frank Frank Ocean yeah you where know? it would say air it says ocean yes <laughs> yeah. exactly and so like that shirt instantly I'm like oh fuck and like I'm driving home from ComplexCon I'm like I gotta make the site that night I'm on the computer making the website did the mock-up Shopify's up Literally, I send it out to Hypebeast, High Snobiety, call up both the dudes. I'm like, hey, I need this up. Please help me out. Got it up. I woke up the next morning, and my phone just wouldn't stop vibrating. I thought it was broken. I thought the fucking cable had broken. Mm -hmm. It hit $40,000 within fucking overnight. And so, you know, this shit's fucking off the wall. All of a sudden, I have my boy driving to Chatsworth. I'm at this fucking fulfillment place with the screen printer. We're talking, getting the shit about to get printed up, like, all in one day. Mm -hmm. But and you had to have known that, like... You were asking for it, right? You're violating two big entities: Frank Ocean, a property of whatever Universal Music, I'm yeah. sure, or some label, uh -huh. and Nike. Yeah, and, and you, you bought a URL. You're making shirts, sure right? And now overnight, you've got 40k in your bank. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> you know, at first I'm like, oh shit, I didn't. Even, like, I just got excited. And I'm like, yeah, I'm like, oh shit, I got away with it. Like the shit worked. It's fucking sick. like this is sick. I'm like, I'm out of debt. I'm buying a car. Like. Yes, you know, like I'm gonna get an apartment. So like, you know, all those fucking bells are going off. I'm like, oh shit. Yeah. And then you know, all of a sudden, six o'clock rolls around. Um, I'm, it's actually the day that we were all voting for fucking Trump or whatever. Uh, and <laughs> I get out of the fucking voting poll and I get an email from Frank Ocean's lawyer and it's a trademark infringement and cease and desist. Okay. And so that took how long? A day. It took a day. Okay. It took a day. Um, okay. Yeah. So, which, so the morning you you made forty k yeah. plus. And then by the night, by six p.m. that night, I had you're a, getting sued by. Frank I had an email okay. saying, "Yeah, she's in the sex trade market punishment, the whole thing." Okay. So you know, all of a sudden, I'm like, "Who in streetwear can I call?" Greg Mishka. 
you know, talk to Greg. Like, <laughs> That's ran- awesome. Randomly get him on the phone, like, because he's been sued by left and right by random, like, you oh, know, okay. cartoon people and, like, random dudes in this world just from, like, them doing all the characters yeah. and, like, flipping things. So he's, he was just like, dude, just run it. Just, like, you know, have a good lawyer help you write an email, whatever. Just, like, have it be like, you know, we didn't make that many, whatever. Mm-hmm. I just didn't have the fucking wherewithal to find a lawyer at the time. And, like, I just didn't, whatever. Um, and it just kind of... It, it, it kind of scared me yeah. so much that I was just like, you know what, man? Like, I got an email two hours later. Stripe had frozen half of the funds because they no, like noticed the that bank was, that's holding the money froze yeah, the funds. Froze the funds because tra- uh, Frank's team had hit up Stripe, the credit card processor, and sent mm-hmm. this trademark infringement. And then the other half of the money was in PayPal, which I could have gotten that money. Mm-hmm. But it was a brand new PayPal. Probably would have gotten held up. And I just decided, I'm like, you know what? Not worth it. Mm-hmm. I'm just going to refund all the money. But what this was to me was an exercise in idea. Mm-hmm. And this is what's kind of spawned me into everything else that I've now done. Because instead of going out and being so blatant about it, being so upfront about it, I can be more low-key and underground, build a little bit of a bait-and-switch idea where I can offer you all these awesome bootlegs, cool pieces that you could ever buy, or things that you would never be able to attain because it's either too expensive or too hard to find. And then I'm going to bait and switch you on some awesome graphics that I make that are totally legal. Mm-hmm. Right. You know? How and did it feel to have to give back? Or not, I don't know. Did you give it back, all the money? I basically just sat in Shopify for an hour and I just hit refund, refund, refund. <laughs> and it was the saddest day ever. You know? But at the same time, I was like, holy shit. Like, I, I, this, this, it could work. You know? Like, mm-hmm. if I just did this in one day, like, I just got to figure out this, the system. Yeah. You know? And I've started to figure it out. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, it's, it's a constant game of just like give and take, give and take. Yeah. Do you think um, you deserved, like just talking about this Frank Ocean outcome, like do you think it was deserved or do you think you actually, you know, you could argue that it's a bootleg, but you created something new. Right? I basically took two of the most popular things at the time. Because Frank Ocean's album just come out, yeah. had just come out, and the song Nike's was also the most popular song on the album, mm-hmm. and Nike's the most popping shoe brand that year. Yeah, it was like the perfect synergy. Right, and put them both on a shirt. Nike never said a word, mm-hmm. uh, not to say Nike, please don't hit me up now. Uh, but I was on Nike campus like two months later, handing these shirts out to people, and that's how it got me some more work. Mm-hmm. Like. I was handing out this bootleg shirt on Nike campus and design directors of NSW, running, all these other things being like, this is my favorite shirt, this is so cool, getting emails after, and I'm like, holy shit. I wonder if Frank Ocean got permission to name a song Nike. I wonder, you know? (laughs) You should have have photoshopped a letter that says like, yeah, we're countersuing you for using our name (laughs) in the song. (laughs) It would have been sick, you know? So, you know, fast forward a little bit into after all the like, kind of hysteria I basically sent an email back to Frank Ocean's lawyers and was like sorry I didn't make that many I'm just a big fan of Frank like you know whatever and I never got an email again Yeah. so that was a little lesson to me to be like unless I'm fucking out here making a million dollars these people don't give a fuck no you know? a cease and desist is like it a template that they have that they just like drag onto shit. an email I mean yeah. I, funny enough like I made recently uh, an 8 ball t-shirt I didn't even think about it and I got the nicest cease and desist from Stussy I I've ever received in my life. They literally in the email were like, we could take this off of Urban Outfitters' website immediately, but instead of doing that, we're just going to be nice, let you sell them all out, and then as long as you didn't make that many, we're all good. Just don't do it again. I didn't even think Stussy owns the eight ball. Dude, I'll show you the email I got. It was crazy. They have a, like, it's literally like the trademark, US trademark. Of an eight ball. That's fucking amazing. Yeah. Fuck. Yeah, dude, it's (laughs) sick. I you mean, think about like the eight ball leather jacket and all that yeah, shit that was I mean, like that preceded Stussy. Exactly. But they were smart enough to own it. And the funniest thing is that there's a thing in New York called eight ball zines. Mm-hmm. Those dudes came after me like six months ago saying I copied them, stole their shit. And I'm like, guys, have we neither of us heard of Stussy? <laughs> like, let's be real. Like, right. come on. It's a fucking eight ball. Are you, you just know? fighting lawyers all day long? You know, it's job? not even just lawyers. <laughs> what it is, is I found nowadays is it's a bunch of kids on the internet giving them too much credit. Mm-hmm. giving themselves too much credit mm-hmm. because a lot of kids they do something and they're just like I'm the original mm-hmm. you didn't do it first like I just saw like uh, Josh Vitas did these Air Force Ones that he did like the outlines on and then like some kid tried to call him out saying I did it first but the kid did it after him and then like I did the Converse swoosh thing but the reality is an artist named Devin Troy had done it first painting them on the sides of, of Converse and then I'm sure 20 other kids have done it mm-hmm. Virgil <laughs> apparently did it like all these people have done it so right. it's like Sometimes people start to get so personal being like, you stole from me. And it's like, dude, I don't even know who you are. I don't follow you. I don't care about you. Yeah. You don't mean anything to me. Mm-hmm. So 
we just happen to have the same idea. Yeah. You know, it's just like uh, Pleasures and I, we did a collaboration with the Gunshot Smiley Face. Mm -hmm. Well, it turns out the next season, 10 Deep had released the Gunshot Smiley. Well, it wasn't that we had like been copied by Scott. It was actually that Scott had fucking come up with the idea at the same time as us, but his production schedule is a year behind us mm -hmm. and we can work quicker. Yeah. So, you know, it's things like this where sometimes you get caught up when you're a wholesale brand because you have an idea that had to take six to eight months to even come out. Right. You know? And uh, and we're all in the same industry. We see similar things. We all just, have the same books. Yeah. We all have the same fucking websites we go to. Mm -hmm. We all know all the fucking back ends. There's very few things that are hidden and guarded anymore. Yeah. And so the reality is, man, is that it's going to happen all the time. I mean, like there was like, I love speaking on this kind of shit because I think it's funny when friends beef with each other, but like ignore prayers and pleasures, they were friends. Mm -hmm. But they're not friends anymore because of the other fact that like, they are too much in the same world, but the reality is that they, they all work in the same creative space. Mm -hmm. And like at one point, they actually shared an office, you know. And so like, they and was were, there a shared design? Is that what happened? It's just like someone does a design, someone feels like it was influenced by another thing. Like, oh, you copied this thing. Like, oh, you're doing what I'm doing. Oh, mm -hmm. you posted the same content as me. It's like, well, you guys just took the content from somewhere else. Yeah. And it's just like the whole thing where you're like, guys, aren't you friends? Like, don't you acknowledge that we're all just fucking making cotton at the end of the day? It's right. like, it doesn't fucking mean anything. And that's why I get so annoyed sometimes with people who are like such like true like lifers of like like I'm gonna keep it true I'm gonna keep it this it's like sometimes man it's like it's just a fucking t-shirt mm -hmm. like yes it has a meaning to like a certain small sect of people but like come on yeah you know it's not that serious it's not it's really <laughs> fucking not and when we all get into like who's copying who and who's like all this shit I'm just like whatever yeah you know there's been, look, look how many fucking knockoff brands that we're not talking about right you know look at Kmart fucking Target look at all these guys who are just fucking running us H&M Zara mm -hmm. like we're getting run but you guys also still shopping there but you want to call out the fucking small guy yeah and not to say any of it's okay but, mm -hmm. yeah so how's Chinatown Market doing now very well and you is know? it like so we're sitting in your office right now everything happens out of here for the most part uh, so everything from shipping sampling uh, we have a small photo studio in here, which uh, photographer kind of just uh, is in here as well. And then um, we have a full kind of like sample sewing setup, uh, and we're getting an embroidery machine in here soon. Mm -hmm. So I basically have the full scale ability to make any idea at any time. If I want to make it, it'll happen. Mm -hmm. Are you happy now? Yes, but it's a loaded question because I think the reality is that I'm inherently never satisfied. Like if I was satisfied, I'd probably just be good with what this is, but I'd I want to go build 10 of these. I want to go make more. I want to help people do these, do exactly what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. um, there's so many talented friends of mine that I see who have skills that just don't have the business acumen to go do it. Yeah. You know, like it's people who I see get played on contracts all day, like all the things that I went through. It's like, I'd love to see people fucking do this themselves as well. You know? Did you ever, and, uh, do you still consider like, ever getting a full-time job somewhere and just being steady paycheck like cush. I like think about it but then and like I don't I'm not gonna talk about money like too much but it's just like when you can make $150,000 in a month you're like I or $150,000 in a month like mm -hmm. you can't do that in a job mm -hmm. you just can't right like I don't care what job I'm at. I'm not in banking I'm not getting a fucking bonus at the end of the year for a million dollars like it's just not what it is are you saying you're doing that with Chinatown Market uh, with a bunch of things combined, it, I'm, I'm saying I've had a month like that before. Yeah, you know, like it's and you can't have that at a full time. No, job. Like you can't. Mm -hmm. And like a, you know, those months happen for me hustling on design, on consulting, mm -hmm. on Chinatown, on like four other things, and doing production for other people. Like I have brands I do production for that no one even knows about. Mm -hmm. You know, but I basically just have a production partner that I work with who helps me do everything. Yeah, you know, and right. it's relationships like that and people like that that are are kind of the cornerstone of what I do. Mm -hmm. But when you started Chinatown, you you didn't think it was going to be like a multi million dollar brand. What about no. now? Uh, I mean, yeah, it could be. It is. Oh, it is. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so so mission accomplished there. And now you want to grow that? Like you want Chinatown to be like Polo? Or you're gonna... no 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 no. Okay, not at all. So I you're not going to make it into like it a... could die in a year, and I don't care. Okay, that's the reality. That's... Is that like it's an exercise of fun, creative ideas? And that's like... and that's the difference, I think. You know, between like me doing Staple and you doing Chinatown, like I would never say that about Staple. And in some ways, I'm jealous that you can say like I'll crash and burn. Chinatown. But look at Hiroshi, the two lightning bolts for like. Well, no, but then, but then even like he can make the pool, and then he can do oh, yeah, like yeah. fucking like all these different things, and they can be gone in two years. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, it was that awesome thing you got to experience, and it's gone. Yeah. Why can't I do that? Right. 
You know, why can't I have fun putting my ideas into something and then remove it when I feel like it's gotten dead, you know, mm-hmm. or that I feel like it's, it's run its course. Yeah. Like with ICNY, I had kind of ran my course of different products I wanted to make. And then I just started putting reflective on shit, mm-hmm. you know, and I started making graphics. Like how can it be reflective? What can be reflective? And, yeah. You know, it's like sometimes the idea can only go so far. And as a creative, it's like you can only sink your teeth in so far before you start getting burned out. Mm-hmm. And that's what I felt like sometimes. And now you, you mentioned before that you kind of want to bring back something like an ICNY. Yes, because I think I inherently like have an appreciation for the actual importance of the product of what was being created. Mm-hmm. Um, I inherently love brands like Acronym, Stone Island, Isaora, all these guys. And I appreciate people who actually invest in their product and invest in the design, yeah. you know, and actual functionality because there's nothing better than a functional jacket. I mean, it starts when I was fucking 12 and I got a members only jacket that had a inside pocket and I'm like, this is so cool. You know, and it's like the dumb thing like that that then translates into like, you know, just all the crazy features I can find on jackets that I get now or like, you know, these little things. Like I just bought these Stone Island pants that like the pockets like zip out and then they like they transform into a whole new pant. And it's mm-hmm. just like, sometimes it's like it, makes you just believe that there's a fucking more, more out there than just t-shirts, you know? And like, th- that if you can invest yourself in a show like that, there's a pocket of people out there who will appreciate it. Can you talk about what that next thing is yet? Um, it's a, with a partner in Asia. Um, I'm basically making a massive partnership with a huge factory out there that mm-hmm. does technical apparel. And uh, I can't really talk on the name of it. Yeah. Uh, there's two different brands we're doing. One's more of a skate brand, which will be like an infusion brand for a store out there, mm-hmm. um, which will also be selling out here in the West. And then uh, the other one will be more of like the baby, like the technical higher end uh, direct to consumer kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So when you're when you're entering into this new partnership, are you thinking about back to IRT, ICNY days? I'm not doing shit until that contract's signed and I'm not doing shit until I feel comfortable about it because mm-hmm. it's just like, you know what, man? Last time I fucking just started working, yeah. I started doing shit. Because you're so excited about it. I'm in good faith and then it's on the contract and then we, like it was like, it didn't even mean anything to me. But now it's like, yeah, we got to have all the fucking shit in, in, in order. Like. I don't care that you want it to launch this year. It's like, that's great, but let's get the contract right. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. And yeah. it sounds like you have a, a manufacturer that's like reliable and yeah. good. And, you know, it's also just meeting good people. I think like uh, I finally just like met this awesome company who's been helping me out with like tons of different production stuff that I can never touch, mm-hmm. you know, and it just takes having the infrastructure out there in Asia because, you know, with every 10 good factories there's or you know, 10 factories, there's one really good one yeah. and there's nine shitty ones. Mm-hmm. So it's like, uh, that's been the biggest challenge I think. And I think that's the biggest like naivete of approaching Asia is thinking that you can just go to Asia, send some shit out, get something back. Yeah. And like, I do believe that there's this wrong stigma with Asia in general, not to segue, but China's fucking great. And 90% of American factories suck. So, you know, if we really want to talk about it, made in USA is bullshit. So, mm. yeah, we can go into that one at a time. Though. <laughs> All right, cool. Anything else you want to add? Uh, stop DMing me for free promo gear. Uh, stop asking me like how I make t-shirts because you can go figure it out on the internet and fucking, there's enough videos where I've done it. And like I had a kid literally go on thoughts app yesterday where you can ask people questions for $10, which is great. Mm -hmm. But the kid literally was like, where do you buy your t-shirts? Where do you get your, this, where do you get the heat press? Where do you get the vinyl cutter? What's the program you use? What's this? And I'm like, for $10, you want to get all that? Like, sorry, you're going to have to email them for a refund because I'm not getting you all that information for $10. Was that your answer to him? Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, you know what, dude? Like, it's, it's bullshit. Mm-hmm. You know? Like, don't come at me like that. Why do you think that effect is happening? Because it's too easy to reach people now. Mm-hmm. Like, someone could, if you wanted to respond, some kid could reach you. Mm-hmm. You know? It's yeah. the reality. It's like if a kid, and I mean, it's good and bad because there's those amazing, talented kids who you can find because they can reach you. Mm-hmm. But conversely, it's a bunch of fucking idiots out there who are just like... I love Jeff. I just want to like, like hey, Jeff, can I have a job? Can I have a free t-shirt? Mm-hmm. Can I get some shoes? And you're just like, I'm like well, what made you even think that you should send that message? Yeah. It's you interesting. Know? Yeah. But, but I think it's just a different mentality. That and then I, I don't know. I just think like any kid out there who's in school or just wants to have a design career, whatever it is, like go out there and try to do it. Mm-hmm. Don't just try to like get a job doing it, but go out and put yourself in the mix. And, like go learn it. Like go fail. Go fucking fail really hard. Yeah. You know, it's like, I think two people are afraid to fail and are fa- afraid to put themselves out there right. to do anything. Yeah. So, all right. It's a good way yeah. to end it. Awesome. Thank you, man. Yeah. Appreciate it. All right. Thanks for listening to the episode. You can find out more about the show or listen to past episodes at hypebeast.com slash radio. Subscribe to us wherever you listen to podcasts. I personally use Overcast. And you can reach out to me on Twitter. I'm at Jeff Staple. 
Check us out on the web at businessofhype.com and you can email any questions to questions at businessofhype.com. The Business of Hype is directed by Daniel Novetta, edited and produced by Bright Young Things. You can check them out at byt.nyc. This was recorded at Sibling Rivalry Studio in New York City and on location in downtown Los Angeles, California. I'm Jeff Staple, and you've been listening to the Business of Hype on Hype Beast Radio. Ooh. Yeah, I can, I can, uh, I can schmooze about that shit. God, I got um. <laughs> speaking of that, I got, I got a tweet today from this guy. He's like, at Jeff. How can I work for you and your company as a Mac tech or applications engineer supporting Adobe Creative and other graphic apps? I was like, wow, that's a pretty professionally written tweet. Same guy, next tweet. Need them pigeons in my closet. Like, <laughs> you just fucking blew show, it. You blew it, dude. Yeah. You like, I actually was kind of interested in hearing what you had to say. And then you fucking idiot just had to do that. Yeah, man, it's it's a it's, it's amazing to me sometimes, and like, but that's what it kind of sums it up to is that like half the people just want like some cool points or like they some thing, free gear, really. Yeah. yeah, and like it's like cool, you want to work for me for free, but like the reality is, yeah, it's just a bunch of fucking people out there who just want to be cool or be a part of like this thing, but they don't understand what the what the actual business is, and, yeah, like, the work that goes into it. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, there's just so many talented kids out here, but not that many kids who actually want to go out there and do the work. Yeah, and I think that's like my, my biggest pet peeve. I think in general is like. Just fucking put your head down. Stop asking questions. Take mm-hmm. the jobs you don't like. Take the ones you do like. Do whatever you can. Yeah. You know?